Hi, my name is Eric Bucci, and we're so glad that you're here today, and this is your first time here at Cornerstone Church. We want to welcome you. Thank you for being our guest. Can you guys do me a big favor, or two, three things? Can, first of all, thank you for being here. Number two, we want to welcome everyone that's here, and also let a, a big shout from Mama. Come on. Nice and big. Amen. We thank God for our mothers. What a blessing it is. It's Mother's Day, and if you haven't got your card yet, we're going to help you out a little bit today. But we'll show up out after the service today. Hey, we're in a series uh, called uh, Unshakable. And this is really Unshakable Marriages, Unshakable Families. And it's all about First Peter. We're going through First Peter. It's a book of the Bible written by the Apostle Peter. The Apostle Peter was one of Jesus' twelve. And uh, this is written about from 50 to 60 A.D. The church starts experiencing significant amount of persecution at this time. It gets really, 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 really bad later with soon. Thank you. <laughs> and, uh, and that's what happens with that. And so we've been going through this, and we've been talking about wives and husbands and wives submitting. So let's go ahead, and we're going to get into that, but I just want to go ahead and get right to the meat of it uh, today. And um, here it is. The wise woman builds her house, but the foolish pulls it down with her hands. And we're going to talk about that today, and, and, and husbands and wives just a little bit. It's very interesting that God has given us a gift. Sometimes our greatest gift can be our greatest downfall. That what often is your gift can be also your undoing. God has given women, generally speaking, of course, the ability to turn a home into a house, uh, or a house into a home, excuse me, a, an apartment into a home. They have an ability to create such an atmosphere of, of joy, an atmosphere of safety. Just They have something that men don't have, generally speaking. Now, I know this is controversial today, but men and women are different than each other. I, yeah, they really are, and, and thank God that they are. Thank God that we have different types of people. Thank God there's evening, there's day, there's evening, there's different seasons. Each one's different. And diversity is a great thing, not a bad thing. And so uniformity like that is, is frankly boring. Can you imagine if all we had was American food? Hot dogs and hamburgers? God loves diversity. You go around the world, so they think about American food, hot dogs and hamburgers. Even though Frankfurt just comes from, okay, let's move forward. But a wise woman builds her house, but the foolish pulls it down with her hands. Both men and women have a sin problem we have to contend with, okay? This is the issue between husbands and wives, men and women, we have a sin problem. You and I, when we are sinned against, we often respond by sinning, missing the mark. You know what sin means? It just means missing the mark. It doesn't mean having fun and you shouldn't. It simply means missing the mark. That's all it means. So this is what can happen, ladies and, and, and men as well. The very thing you're doing to improve your marriage may be tearing it down. What comes naturally often is the wrong thing to do. How many of you ever thought that? I shouldn't say it. I shouldn't say it. Don't say it. Don't say it. Don't say it. I'm going to go ahead and say it. You, just, we're having a little dialogue inside of you, right? And bow, and you're like, and as it's coming out of your mouth, and you're like, no. I didn't mean to say oh. It's like trying to put feathers back into a pillow on top of a roof. You can't. Then you say it. And they never forget it. Right? So often we say things. We tear it down with our mouths. And, and so often the very thing you're doing to improve your marriage may be the worst thing you're doing. And here, here's some ways. I just, ladies, we're going to talk about the guys too. Last week, Pastor Rich got into the guys. He left me this hard section. <laughs> Thanks, Pastor Rich. Wherever you're located, thank you. <laughs> he did a great job last week talking about husband's responsibility, right? And you can go back and listen to it. And I also started, I started the first week. Go to cornerstonetreasure.com. You can catch up on the sermons. You can also go to Spotify or iTunes and, and type Cornerstone Cheshire. There's a million cornerstones out there. You got to put Cornerstone Cheshire. It comes up. You can subscribe and catch up, okay? So ways not to change your husband. Fight him with shame. It just doesn't work. Shame never works. Does God ever give us shame? No. God gives us conviction. He says, you can do better than this. This is wrong. God gives conviction, not shame. Shame is just pouring something on somebody. Or how about this one? Nag them. Oh, nag them and bag them, right? 
Nagging never works. It feels so good. And, and, and you know what? I do nag myself. I might not be a woman, but I do nag. Ask the staff. They'll tell you. When it comes to weeds in the grass, you can ask Janine, my sister. She said, Pastor, I, I hate, I always nag about the weeds. What you call that? <laughs> I mean, I, nagging is you keep on saying the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over. And it's not very productive. It just becomes annoying. It's like trying to sleep at night and there's a mosquito buzzing in your ear. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Another, another question I have to ask you, and we're going to go to heaven one day. God, why did you create mice, rats, and mosquitoes? Let's just leave it there. Okay. Fight them with shame, nag them, or how about this? Seduce them. Guys are like, yeah. No, 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 no. This is like withholding sex to control them. Using sex as a weapon. Now, I'm not suggesting women just run around all day long in Victoria's Secret outfits and trying to seduce their husbands. Uh, no, guys, wake up. But no, we're not talking about that. We're not talking about women being doormats, but withholding. Bible says, do not deny each other except for a season of fasting and praying. Maybe this is why men don't like fasting and praying. But anyhow, <laughs> the, the Bible does say that. Do not deny each other. And so you know, men have needs, women have needs, and, it, and we, we're different than each other. I don't know if you realize that. We don't have time to get into all this. We might bring this up next time we come together. But the situation is using sex as a weapon is not a really good thing to do. doesn't mean that you're a boy toy either. It simply means, I'm going to be frank with you. Listen, if, can we be real? The world is like ridiculously like crude. Why can't we talk about this stuff in church? we got to be able to talk about this, everybody. All right, so... Seducing him and using sex as a weapon is not a good thing, or manipulating him. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to go there. Uh, should I go there? Yeah, I'm going to go there. Uh, you know, sometimes we use, men use, I'm working so hard, sometimes women use a certain acronym. I starts with a P, ends with an S. I'll just leave it right there. Blame everything on that. It's like blaming everything on COVID. I, I need some help, guys. Come on. <laughs> but you can't blame it all on, on, on what happens once a month either, everybody. Right? And so this is what happened. Man, we, we do the same thing. I'm really in hot water here, everybody. Pastor Rich, thanks a lot. Okay. <laughs> Both men and women have a sin problem we have to contend with. And also, the way that brings the most immediate relief brings longer-term pain. Can I hear it? Oh, no. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about, right? Well, how do we deal with this? Well, I want to review the series a little bit, and we're going to talk about what this actually means. Peter talks about how to deal with persecution and also how to deal with sometimes being in a marriage and being in a family can be persecution. we got to learn how to deal with it. He gives us the Tells us how to do it, okay? And what he does, first of all, in First Peter, primarily, he talks about our identity. Your identity and my identity in Jesus Christ is so important. You see, identity determines what you do. Everything you do springs up out of your identity. Why is it there's such an identity crisis in the world today, in particular America, that the enemy always goes after identity. If you don't know who you are, you'll act like you're not supposed to be, and damage happens. When Jesus was first called into the ministry, when he was publicly inaugurated in the Jordan River, God the Father said, this is my beloved son, and who I'm well pleased. The next thing you know, he took, gave him his identity. You are my son, who I'm well pleased. Of the next period of time, he's in the wilderness. The enemy comes after his identity. If you are the Son of, if you are, if you are, goes after Jesus' identity, he does the same thing to you. What kind of Christian are you? You're done. You blew it. You're the third divorce or whatever. You can't help it. This is the way you are. He goes after your identity. And so what we want to know is our identity is not wrapped up in who we are. Our identity is wrapped up in who Jesus is. When you become a Christian, all things have passed away. Behold, all things are new. You are a new creation in Christ Jesus. So, if we fully embrace our identity in Christ, it will radically impact, impact our behavior in the world. If it doesn't, then you've got to ask yourself the question, am I really a Christ follower? Or am I just a Christian philosopher that just likes to pull out Christian stuff? All right? So, this is what Peter says, and I told you guys to look yourself in the mirror and, and tell yourself who you are. You are a chosen race. Yeah, I may be an Italian-American. I'm not an Italian-American German Christian, I am a, 
I am a son of God that lives in America with an ethnicity that comes from Germany and Italy and wherever else it comes from. My identity is not wrapped up in my ethnicity. My identity is wrapped up in Jesus. My identity, my sin does not define me. My Savior defines me. God is your identity. So you are a chosen race. You are a royal priesthood. When, you know, Jesus' skin was ripped for us. It's not about our skin color. Jesus determines the skin. He took the skin for us to bring unity to the body of Christ. No matter what you are, no matter what you do, if you're a child of God, that's number one. Everything else. So that's why racism has absolutely no place. Elitism has absolutely no place in, it should have absolutely no place in the church at all. At all. So you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim his excellencies, who called you out of the darkness into the marvelous light. We talked about that. Once you were not a people, now you are God's people. Once you were not, did not receive mercy, but now you have received mercy. Now, what does this, all this mean? As a result of your identity, this is what God calls us to do. What Peter does, he gives us illustrations. He talks about how we deal with it. He says the following. Keep your conduct among Gentiles, those are people outside the church, honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds. They can't help it. I, I, him or her, I can't help it. Yeah, they may, they may. I don't like what they do, but you know what? They do the right thing. Right? They may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Now, last time we got together, uh, Pastor Rich talked about verse 7. I'm having a little trouble with this. Hold on a second. Can you guys hear me okay? There's a lot of noise. It's okay? All right. Wives, likewise, be submissive. We talked about that last time. Be submissive. And what we dealt with, by the way, prior to this, this whole period of, of Scripture, we dealt with several things. We dealt with... Honor the government. Honor those in authority over you. We talked about that. Then we talked about slaves and masters. The how you're supposed to... And yeah, we talked about slavery. We dealt with that. Then we dealt with Jesus and how Jesus even submitted himself. And then we talked about likewise, wise being submissive. And the word likewise, con, uh, what it does is it connects everything to what we talked about before. I'm sorry, everybody. I'm going to change it up. I'm bothered by this a little bit. Um, here we go. Thank you. There we go. Thank you so much. Um, all right. Where I was talking about? Uh, yeah, I'm back. <laughs> so the likewise connects everything in the previous verses. So just as you're submitting to governing officials, just as you were to submit, just as Jesus submitted to God, just as um, slaves to masters and all that, we are to submit. Wives are to submit. Likewise, be submissive, and we'll get into that in a few moments, to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey, and the context of this passage is unbelieving spouses, okay? Even if they, some do not obey by the word, without a word, they may be won over by the conduct of their wives when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear, which means respect, okay? However, let each of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. That was last. That was part of last week as well. Where that we just want to mention this, this briefly. It's so important that men and women are a little bit different than each other. When you go to the inner city and you're dealing with gang violence, often the uh, gang warfare will begin because the guy says they didn't show me what respect. You know that song by Aretha Franklin, R E S P T. She did not write it. Guess who wrote it? A man wrote it. But it took a woman to get put it right. The truth of the matter is, men desire respect. It's, it, it's part of love. And they want to be told that there's something. They, they need affirmation big time, right? Women like to be shown love. What's that? Love, I mean, that loving feeling. They like to be, generally speaking, they like to be cherished. They like to be taken care of. They like to be loved, know that you're beautiful. I love you from the inside out. The whole thing. They like all that. Man, you know, if I get a card or flowers, I could not care less if I get a card or flowers. Okay, but if I showed respect, and she tells me, you guys could, like, everyone could come down here and fall here and say, Pastor, you're the greatest thing that ever happened. But if I get in the car, my wife says, that was horrible. I'm, I'm devastated. But if my wife says, honey, you're all that. You're the cat's meow. No, no, that's not good enough, honey. She goes, you're the dog's bark. That's good. <laughs> so. I mean, my wife's saying the right thing. I mean, it means the world to me, right? 
So however, let each of you love his wife as as himself. I mean, you could, if you love yourself, you take care of yourself, right? It says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. So women need to be shown love. Men need to be shown respect. See, the wife respects her husband. If men don't feel respected, they don't want to show love. If women don't feel love, they don't want to show respect. She disrespects me. I'm not showing her love. He's not loving me. I'm not going to show him respect. You see what happens? And we had this, this snowball going down the mountain of, of irreparable relationships. That's what we want. How much better is it to show her love and show, her, show you respect? Let, let me say something that might be controversial. Might as well. Uh, <laughs> when, I got, when I bought an engagement ring years ago, uh, a gentleman that sold it to me was a, a believing man, older man. Married 60 some odd years. He said, let me give you a piece of advice. I said, yes, sir. What is it? There's two people in this world you cannot outgive. I'm like, what is that? You cannot outgive God. Whatever you give God, you can, I, you can try all you like. God will always outgive you. Number two, you can't outgive a godly woman, your godly wife. Let me tell you something right now. I've tried. If I show any kind of grace to Sandra, she shows so much more back to me. I can't help it. I, I try to out. I cannot outdo her. I can't. God is, women are like gods. That's what we call them, goddesses. I'm serious. You can't outgive a godly woman, and he's right. So, however, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and that the wife respects her husband. Okay, then we go to First Peter. We go, likewise, husbands, right? Likewise, that was last week with Pastor Rich. Sometimes our prayers are not being answered because we're not treating our wives right. They're the weaker vessel in the area of frame. You know, men and women are different from each other. I don't know if you recognize that, that generally speaking, of course, we're not going to go there today. Let's move on with our, what we're talking about today, okay? Both men and women have a sin problem that we have to fight against. The way that brings the most immediate relief brings long-term pain. We have to choose the lesser the, the, the path less traveled. That is the godly path. Okay? So, typically, the way you try to convince your husband to change makes him more resistant to that change. It gets getting worse and worse and worse. The more you try, the worse it gets. And you get so frustrated. I heard of a story of a, there was a mule on the ground on a farm, and they could, no one could get this mule to get up. Finally, an old woman comes in, the old grandmother of the farm, gets a baseball back, whacks the mule with the bat, and the mule gets right up. And I said, why did you do that? That's the only way the mule listens. <laughs> well, sometimes man can be a little uh, uh, like a mule. I'm not going to say the King James version of that. For those of you that are, that are scripted in King James, you know what I'm talking about. Jesus wrote in on a, but we're not going to mention that. Sometimes we're stubborn. And the easy thing to do is grab a bat and whack us over the head. That's not the way you get results. You might get quick results, but not long-lasting results. How to change your husband. Here we go. Submission is your best role of influence. What? Remember, everybody, submission in the biblical sense means following the leadership of your husband. You go, out of, you go out of sorts, it's going to cause all kinds of problems. So what submission does not mean is this. It does not mean inequality or inferiority at all. The Bible says in Galatians that men, women, uh, slaves, no matter who you are, we're all the same. We're all heirs of Abraham. We have the same rights. We have the same privileges. We're co-heirs, co-equals. So you're not better men than women. Women, you're not better than men, although I think that you are. But, okay? So, not inequality or inferiority. Does not mean women should submit to men in area area of life. If your husband is saying something to you to do something that's out of God's way, you should not listen to that. Or if never abuse. I told you right now, if you're getting abused physically or even verbally, I'm not talking about women do the laundry. I'm talking bad verbal abuse. You get out of there. Get, get, I'm serious. You get what you tolerate. Do not tolerate being beat up, being manhandled at all. Okay? Never tolerate that. And let us know. We'll help you. If you don't have a, uh, we'll call the police. We'll do what we have to do. We got people here that care. No, no, we'll move forward. Does not mean women should submit to men in every area of life. And husbands is not the only authority. 
So th- that's part of what we talked about, okay? Also, how to change your husband. Submission is your best role of influence. Remember, it's follow the leadership of your husband. Here's another one. Words typically do not work if they're negative for sure. I mean, it just doesn't work. It's, it's irritating. It really is. and It really is. It's better to live in a corner of, of a housetop than in a house shared with a quarrelsome wife. I didn't make this up, okay, everybody? You got a problem with this, you go to Solomon. I'm just, I'm just a mailman. I'm just a mailman here, okay? So uh, here's another one. It's better to live in a desert. He goes from the roof to a desert than with a quarrelsome and fretful woman. It's better to live in a corner. And by the way, some men can nag too. Can I hear an amen, ladies? Okay. Some of you are not being truthful, okay? It's better to live in a corner of a household than a, with a corner housetop than in a house shared with a quarrelsome wife, okay? So when you nag, he will want to neglect. When you nag, he will drag. Put that on your Twitter account, please. When you nag, he will drag. He'll take longer and longer and longer. I mean, if you're driving home one day and uh, you just bought your wife flowers because you thought she likes flowers, and she calls you on the phone and says, you don't buy me flowers anymore. You're like, open the window. Whoop, there it goes. (laughs) Right? Come on, guys. You know what I'm talking about. No woman gonna tell me what to do. Okay, we've been we don't, men don't want to marry their mothers. Contrary to what you think, ladies, they want a wife, not a mother. Sometimes they act like babies and need to be mothered, but that's beside the point. But when you nag, he'll drag. Boy, that's good. When you nag, he will act. He will want to neglect. Here's another one: neglect by a husband often results in nagging by a wife. If you're getting nagged, there's probably a reason. Just saying. Go to last week. Finally, uh, submission is your best role. Words typically don't work. Especially when they're negative words, it's counterproductive. And sedu- seduction and manipulation are not long-term strategies for change in a marriage. If, if your husband comes home thinking, what am I going to find when I go home? Is it going to be a Category 5, a Category 1? <laughs> just saying, I don't know what's going to happen when I go home. And, you know, just, just manipulation. And then what happens? Yes, dear. Yes, dear. Yes, dear. I mean, I always get the last word in. Yes, dear. So what, what can happen, everybody, is if this goes on, I, I've seen a passive-aggressive men. I've been around a little while now, more than I would like to admit. And I, I've seen passive men all my life. I said, well, he's such a nice husband. His wife's kind of bossy, but that's okay. You know. Boy, she's always tearing him down at a party. I go to a party, her husband, her wife's just, just like filleting her husband. Oh, he's such a loser. He came like, he forgets everything. And then I'm like, man. And one day, where's, where's, what happened to this couple? They stopped coming to church. I'm not talking, you know, many times this happened. I don't know. Jack got up and left. We don't know where Jack is. He's gone. My husband left me. I don't know what happened. And finally, the silo got so full, it exploded, and he had enough. There can come a time where it gets that way. It's not, I'm not saying it's right. But nagging does not work. Seduction and manipulation do not work. Using the bedroom is, does not work. Okay, that's the wrong thing to do. Next week, we'll help Pastor Rich talk about the bedroom. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Whew. Seduction and manipulation are not long-term strategies for change in marriage. Okay, how do you de- how to deal with husbands when in conflict? What do we do? Well, the Bible goes on in 1 Peter 2. It says the following. It says, when they see your respectful and pure conduct, they see respectful, respect, okay? Respect. Remember, hear Aretha Franklin and remind yourself a man wrote the song, okay? When they see your respect and pure conduct, do not let your adorning to be external, the braiding of your hair, and the word braiding of your hair actually comes from the word cosmos, which we get the word cosmetic, which comes from cosmos, the world. Sometimes we put on the world to look good. We spend a lot of time in front of a mirror. We look good for everyone at work. We come home, you look like the creature of the black lagoon. But at work, you're beautiful. Some of you have a bathrobe you've had since your great-grandmother gave it to you. <laughs> but you go to work, you look like you walked out of a magazine, all right? Do not let your adorning to be external. The braiding of the hair and the putting on of gold jewelry. 
That's why, man, we don't have to buy them anything anymore. No, just kidding. Or the clothing you wear. But let your adorning be the hidden person in the heart with, uh, with the imperishable beauty, excuse me, of a gentle and quiet spirit. doesn't mean you walk around, yes, dear. No, we're not talking about a yes, dear woman. In fact, the reason I like Sandra because she a woman, she's a woman of her own. She's not a yes, dear woman. She challenges me, which I love. But she challenges me in a good way, right? So in a quiet spirit. So you can, you can still be boisterous and be quiet inside, okay? A quiet, and, uh, a quiet spirit, which God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands. We talk about Sarah. Sarah was a fine woman. How many 90-year-old women get hit on by kings? I mean, she was fine as they come. She was beautiful. She's an old woman, and the men are hitting on her. And Abraham says, hey, you, say you're my sister. I mean, that's how beautiful she was. So she was beautiful not, on the, not only on the outside. The, body didn't talk, the Bible does not talk about that. It talks about how beautiful she was on the inside. All right? For this is how the holy women hoped in God, used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands. As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening because you had that thing happening inside of you. The Bible says in Proverbs 12, 4, an excellent wife is the crown to her husband, but, who, but she who brings shame is like rottenness to his bones. Women, you have a tremendous power. God has given you power to carry life inside of you. God has given you power to birth life. God has given women such an amazing power. You're co-heirs with God. Women, you're created in God's image. Wise, we have a, you have a role and men have a role. We should make a difference together. I want to conclude with a description of what a godly wife looks like. And I will say, my wife's not even here. I am so blessed with my wife, Sandra. I could not pick, I could not design a better woman than her. God knew exactly what I needed. And he gave me a woman that I don't even deserve. I say that with all sincerity. Who can find a virtuous and capable wife? She's more precious than rubies. Her husband can trust her. She will greatly enrich his life. Now, if you're not any of these things, don't worry about it. We can take one step closer. But this is what God talks about a woman that's virtuous. She brings him good, not harm. All the days of her life, she finds wool and flax and, and busily spins it. And she is like a, she's, she's like a merchant ship bringing her food from afar. She prepares breakfast for her household, gets up early, and plans the day's work for her. Serves um, servant girls. She goes, I'm sorry, everybody. She goes to inspect a field and buys it. So she's a businesswoman. She knows how to trade commodities and stocks. And with her earnings, she plants a vineyard. She's energetic and strong, a hard worker. She makes sure her dealings are profitable. Her lamp burns late into the night. Amen, men. What's wrong with you guys? She extends a helping hand to the poor. She opens her arms to the needy. That's why we're doing this today. I can't think of a better day than Mother's Day than to reach out to India as we've done today. She has no fear of winter for her household, for everyone has warm clothes. She makes her own bread spreads. She dresses in fine linen. See, nothing wrong with dressing fine linen and pure gowns. Her husband is well known at the city gates where, she sit, where he sits with the other civic leaders. She makes belted linen garments and sashes to sell the merchants. Again, she knows how to make money. She is clothed with strength and dignity, and she laughs without fear of the future. When she speaks, her words are wise, and she gives instructions with kindness. She carefully watches everything in her household and suffers nothing from laziness. Her children stand and bless her. Her husband praises her. There are many virtuous and capable women in the world, but you surpass them all. Here, listen to this. Charm is deceptive. And beauty does not last. Let me just stop here for a quick moment. We need to do a lot better job with our daughters and granddaughters. Every way you look, there's a, there's a pre-made, there's some perfect model on a magazine. Oh, you're so beautiful. Oh, you're so beautiful. Oh, you tell your daughter that all the time. 
Why not tell our, our daughters what is inside of them more important? You're compassionate. You're caring. You're organized. You're such a go-getter. You're a leader. You're, you, you see things no one else sees. Why don't we focus a lot? I mean, there's nothing wrong with saying you're beautiful, but we focus so much on the exterior. I, I see it all the time. Oh, your daughter's so beautiful. Well, don't say something about her character. So we need to do that. Charm is deceptive and beauty does not last. But a woman who fears the Lord will be greatly praised. Reward her for all she has done. Let her deeds publicly declare her praise. Listen, I want to encourage you today. Ladies, you have a tremendous opportunity. God has created both men and women to work together. It's beautiful. And it's time to forget the world's way and follow God's way. When you follow God's ways, you're blessed. When you follow the world's ways that are against God's ways, you hurt yourself. You break God's laws, the laws break you. God doesn't break you, you break yourself. You jump out of a window and say, I can fly, you have nothing, you know, parachute on or anything, you're going to hurt yourself. The law of gravity will break you. Not God, God put the laws there. You violate God's laws, you break yourself. God wants us to be a whole people. Amen. So, ladies, I, I appreciate ladies today. And, and husbands, we have a job, too. I, I, I'm not Jesus in my marriage like I need to be. Let's have godly families. Amen? Let's pray. Father, I thank you today. Lord, I, I'm not under any delusion here this morning that I, I know with the amount of people we have in this church, both watching online and here, there are some people here this morning or watching later on that have a marriage that's in distress. Father, maybe there's someone here this morning that... The spouse has no idea, but they're seeing a lawyer because they cannot take it anymore. Maybe there's some passive-aggressive people here that are ready to, to, to terminate their marriage. Maybe there's infidelity happening in this place. God, I don't know what's going on. Father, I know it says in your word, what God has joined together, let no man put apart. And Father, we're asking for healing of marriages in this place. In Jesus' name. Lord, we ask that you touch both men and women. Lord, I pray even for us, uh, those of us that are widowed, those of us that are single. Lord, I pray that we would encourage those that are married, Father, that we would, we would work together to see a strong families in this place, in Jesus' name. Father, I pray you touch every marriage, every relationship, every woman here. And I pray, Father, they would know that they're valued by you, that they're beautiful, that they are your daughter, in Jesus' name. Amen. I love my daughter very much, Hannah. And if anyone mistreats her, forget about it. I won't put up with it at all. And I never forget one day, I love it. I'm going to tell a story and a brag. Some guy in the school bus was bullying my daughter, and Luke punched him in the face and broke his glasses. If you don't like that, go to another church. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> Luke, I love you. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, but God loves you ladies very much. Husbands, they're God's daughter. Don't mess with God's little girls. Or you'll get punched in the face too. I'm serious. We are protectors, not abusers. So I want to encourage you with that today, okay? Hey, everybody, um, before we leave here today, I also want to give you another opportunity. Have you given your life to Jesus Christ? I, you know, we don't know. The people that, I've told you this so many times. I, ever since this happened in this church, I do it every week now. We had a person come here and died that week after they were here. And I thank God they had an opportunity to give their life to Christ. I always want to give you an opportunity to give your life to Christ. It's not about me. It's not about Cornerstone. It's about Jesus died on the cross for you. You're messed up. I'm messed up. The world's messed up. No one's right. No one's right. You can't save yourself. You're hopelessly, you're irredeemable. All of us. But Jesus redeemed us. He paid a price we cannot pay. All of us owe God trillions of dollars. You'll never be able to pay it. Jesus paid for it all. And what he asks is very simple. To, to acknowledge he's the Lord, that he died on the cross for you and he rose again from the dead. And to step down from being your God and make him God. Now, if you're still struggling with your faith, you need more evidence, you're welcome to come here. But some of you are ready to make that decision. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. You want to repeat from me and repeat what I'm saying in your hearts to the Lord. This prayer is a way, if you, if you mean it, it will set you up to be a child of God. 
to say here within your own heart. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you rose again from the dead. I ask you to forgive me of everything I've ever done wrong, both known and unknown. And I choose to follow you the rest of my days. Today, I declare I am not the boss of my life. You are. Thank you that I am now your child in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus never says, say a prayer and you're good to go. He didn't say that. He says, come follow me. Cornerstone Church is a church where we're following Jesus. We want to help each other on that journey. In the front pocket of your, of your seat, there's a connection card. Also online, you put up there, following Jesus, that phone number, if you could be so kind. My lovely daughter, who's in the back. Um, Hannah, if you could put that, it would be awesome. Now, now that I put you on the spot. <laughs> the phone number. Oh, there it is. Thank you. See, she's sharp. Uh, to text to believe to 860-499-4888. You should keep it up there one more time, please. Let's keep it up there for a little bit. If you want to follow Jesus, okay? Call that number and put believe, and we'll give you prompts. Or fill out that card in front of you, okay? As we conclude here today, I know we already uh, gave. That was a special offering just for Andy. This is for tithes and offerings. You don't have to give. You get to give. There's a different ways you can give, everybody. Just quickly, you can see it there on your screen. 77977. You can push pay app, cornerstonecheshire.com. You can mail it. As you walk out of here today, there are, there are these boxes. It says ties and offerings or connection cards. Go ahead and drop it in those boxes, everybody. And together, we're making a difference. Amen, everybody. Happy Mother's Day, ladies. You are a blessing. Happy, day, happy Mother's Day, Mom. Happy Mother's Day, Sandra. I love you. God bless you guys.